Well, turn, if you would, you have your copy of God's Word to the Epistle of James. The Epistle of James. A little lower, please. Epistle of James, chapter number 3. James, chapter number 3. I'm going to take a, a quick little break from our usual uh, series. We've got a series going on, uh, critical issues, facing a, a number of critical issues, uh, really in our nation, in our culture, those critical issues that are even facing the body of, of Messiah. So uh, we're going in that series. We're going to take a quick little break this week. James chapter 3. Of course, last week we uh, celebrated our nation's Independence Day. And uh, we talked, of course, about freedom. Our, our freedom from uh, British oppression, correct? And uh, we celebrated and we talked a lot about freedom and then but really, over the past, um, well, year, perhaps, year and a half, even going back before that, we've talked a lot about freedom of speech, freedom of speech. And uh, it's quite interesting because we all talk, we have freedom of speech, but does that mean that we can say just anything? Uh, there are limitations to that freedom, of course. Um, so... One of the questions I was thinking, even as this week was going by, and talking about freedom and freedom of speech and all, um, and since we cannot use our speech just any way we want, um, where do we find truth? If we speak, we ought to be speaking truth. Well, who determines what is truth? Where, where do we find truth? Um, take, for instance, let's say you had a headache. And um, you go to take whether it's Bufferin or Tylenol or Excedrin, whatever your medication of preference is, and you want to get rid of the headache. And so you take it, but perhaps a day goes by or another day, and it just it doesn't seem to be getting any better. In fact, your headache's getting worse. You'll go to the doctor. The doctor will um, run a few tests, so on and so forth. We come to find out, hey, there's an issue with perhaps a blood vessel or, or even a tumor. Okay, so you had the facts. The fact was my head hurts. The fact was I had a headache. But because you lacked truth, there was nothing that you could do about it. So you could have a ton of facts and yet not have truth and be unable to do much of anything. Okay, so if that's the case, where do we find truth? Truth. Yeshua said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So he's the living word. He said, thy word is truth. We have a written word. So that's where we know to find truth. It's in him. It's in his word. Unfortunately, we live in a nation that is pagan. It's a pagan nation. We live in a culture that is secular and sinful. And so we live in this nation, and when this nation is in a world that is lost, it's getting worse. And this nation and this world does not recognize God's truth. And so there's going to be issues. There's going to be issues because you and I know as believers we have truth and the world does not. And so we can use speech, but yet we have truth. We have truth. So our speech can mean something. Our speech can contain, contain truth, and at the same time, our speech can contain lies. Your tongue, the tongue that is in your mouth, has the power to speak truth or spread lies. Your tongue can edify. Your tongue can destroy. So it's a very powerful weapon that no matter your size or shape or strength, you have a powerful tool in your mouth for good or for evil. And so this lesson today, we're going to use James really as like a springboard, a launching pad. We're going to look at Solomon. We're going to look at some writings of the sages. We're going to look at an author or two that I respect. And what we're going to try and do in this short amount of time that we have 
is we're going to take all of these things and we're going to try and put this puzzle piece together so that you and I can use our tongues in the most effective way that we can, speaking truth. There's so much to learn. So much to learn. So let's, let's start. James chapter 3. I'm going to start with verse 1 and read all the way through to verse 12. James chapter 3, verse 1. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now if we put the bits into the horse's mouth so that we will, they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The very world of iniquity, the tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life, and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds and reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives, or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. Wow. Your tongue, my tongue, is a fire. And we think of fire. A fire can be used for many good things. I mean, you can cook your food with a fire. You can cozy up to a fireplace on a chilly winter night. But a fire can be used to hurt, and fire can be used to destroy as well. Father, we come before you. Oh, we pray that your spirit, your word, uh, penetrate, penetrate our minds, penetrate our hearts today. Uh, we have a huge challenge ahead of us. It's a, it's a much more challenge, it's much more challenging than we think. Taming the tongue. It's so easy. So Lord, we're going to need your help. These words that are just simply on a page in front of me, I hope I can, through your power and through your spirit, I can relate to this audience and anybody else that's listening, including myself the lesson that you would have for us today. Lord, we, we want to use what you've given us, a tongue, speech, we, but we want to use it in a glorifying way and not in a destructive way. So Lord, prepare us for what is to come in this lesson. And we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Uh, we're in our weekly study on Tuesday evenings in Proverbs. We just started Proverbs. And when you go to the book of Proverbs, you come to find out it doesn't take very long. Uh, Solomon was a pretty smart cookie, as they say, right? Uh, Proverbs 10, verse 14, he says, Wise people hide their knowledge, but when a fool speaks, ruin is imminent. Proverbs 12, verse 14, one can be filled with good as the result of one's words, and one gets the reward one's deeds deserve. Proverbs 13, verse 3, he who guards his mouth preserves his life, but one who talks too much comes to ruin. Proverbs 18, verse 21, the tongue has power over life and death. Those who indulge it must eat its fruit. Proverbs 21, verse 23, whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps himself out of trouble. So indeed, Yeshua, uh, Solomon was a very wise man and it would do us well to heed his words and his warnings. 
is a uh, old Hasidic story of a young man who was going around the village and spreading vicious rumors about the village rabbi. And uh, he became rather convicted by what he had done. And so he goes, and he visits the rabbi, and he tells him, as a rabbi, I, just, I want to apologize and for what I've done. Please forgive me. The rabbi looks down, and he strokes his beard, and he says, young man, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to go home, go in your house, take a pillow, walk outside, tear that pillow open, and spread the feathers to the wind. And so the young man does this, and he goes on home, and he goes into his house, and he takes out a pillow, and he goes outside, and he rips the pillow open, he spreads the feathers to the wind, and he returns to the rabbi, and he says, am I now forgiven? And the rabbi looked at him and said, one more thing, now go and retrieve all the feathers. <laughs> and the young man looks at him and says, but that's impossible. And the rabbi says, precisely. Precisely. Although you sincerely regret the damage that you have done, you can never get those words back. And those words, trying to get them back, would be like you trying to get back those feathers. Oh, we have to be so careful. We have to be so careful with what we say. And now, <laughs> now there's an added challenge because now it's not so much even what you say, it could be very well what you type. It's that easy. The Hebrew word is lashon. The English word is tongue. And the tongue is an enormously powerful weapon for good or for evil. With your tongue, you have the power, you're sitting on a jury, to acquit the innocent. You also have the power to convict the guilty. With your tongue, if you're a judge, you have the power to send someone to an electric chair or a gas chamber or death by lethal injection. You have that power. Men, you have the power to propose to your girlfriend. Ladies, you have the power to reject the offer or to accept it. The tongue, words, so powerful. And so we need to guard our words that we speak, that little member that can either bring blessing or bring a curse. And again, like I said moments ago, now there's an added challenge. Internet. Apps, social media. And so before, years ago, someone could go ahead and use their tongue to hurt somebody or hurt a couple or hurt a half dozen people. Now all I have to do is type it and hit send and I can hurt half a million. Just like that. Did you know Speaking truth, we talk about speaking truth, but speaking truth, even in an inopportune setting, can be just as bad as telling a lie. Now, at this point, you go, whoa, wait a minute, that, how can that be? I'm speaking the truth. Okay, what was your motivation? How will it affect others? Why did you say what you said? We can use words, we can use words to elevate ourselves at the expense of others. And by doing so, really what we're saying is, look how important I am. Look how influential I am. Look, how, look at the position that I have. I can say or type anything I want to, freedom of speech. I can say anything I want to, regardless of the consequences. And the consequences sometimes can be brutal. Brutal. Try lying on the witness stand. Words. Just words. Try lying on the witness stand. There's a word for that. It's called perjury. And there's a reward that comes along with that. It's called jail time. So I love this thought of freedom of speech. No. No, you, you don't have freedom of speech. You really don't. Careers have been ended because of words. Marriages have been destroyed because of words. Lives have been taken simply because of words. Yet Yeshua, our example, you look and 
the power of his tongue. People were amazed at his teaching. He would speak in parables and they marveled at his appealing words, Luke chapter 4. He used his words to edify and glorify and magnify and to teach. Paul writes in Colossians 4, 6, let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt. What does that mean, salt? What, what is salt good for? Salt preserves, right? Salt holds off the decay. Salt holds off the decay. Salt flavors food. Salt enhances the, the taste and the flavor of food. But oftentimes, that's not how we use our tongues. We use our tongues to hurt and to maim and destroy and to humiliate and to ridicule and to besmirch and to belittle. There's a writing called the Orbat Zadikim. It's the ways of the righteous. In it, there's a little passage and it says, a gossip always seeks out the faults of people. He is like the flies who always rest on the dirty spot. If a man has boils, the flies will ignore the rest of the body and sit on the boil. And thus it is with a gossip. He overlooks all the good in a man and speaks only of the evil. Leviticus 19.16, you shall not go about as a tail bearer among your people. And two verses later, what does it say? Love your neighbor as yourself. Coincidence, right? A tail bearer. What, what, what is a tail bearer? Because man, we love to talk. We just love to talk. I got to talk to somebody. I got to talk to somebody. I got to type something out to somebody. I got to do it. And I, oh, you, you have no idea. Oh, I went over to so-and-so's house and I went over to so -and, and you should have seen their kitchen and they, and the, and the, oh, the granite, they got the carbon and they got the, and this, and they got the stainless steel over here and you should see the dishwasher and all of this stuff. And we're talking and we're talking and we're talking and we're talking and little do we know that maybe, maybe the person that we're talking to, they don't have the money to redo their kitchen. And you're bragging about somebody else and they're hurt inside. Man, we gotta be careful. Just tail bear. Why? Why? Sometimes it is the need to just be important. The need to be important. I gotta let you know. I have to let you know what's going on up in here. And since you're not here in front of me, I'll type it out. Because I gotta let you know. What's going on inside my head? And oftentimes that will get us in trouble. Oh, but we can delete it. Oh, it's out there. Sometimes the need to be so important will find us, will even that need to be so important will even lie. Will even lie. The feel, to, the, the urge to lie. There's a rabbi, Rabbi Joseph Toloshman wrote a number of books. What an author. Um, he wrote a book, tells the true story in this book, Words That Hurt, Words That Heal. And in it, he tells a true story. There was uh, several sociology professors, and they began, they were going to do a little of a, uh, an experiment. So they made up these flyers, and they went around campus, the campus was a Boston's Northeastern University. So they made up these flyers and they were passing them out to students and they were uh, putting them up on the bulletin boards and things like that. And the flyer had to do with a wedding. The wedding was between Robert Goldberg and Mary Ann O'Brien. The wedding was to be on June the 6th at 3.30 p.m. in the afternoon. The only problem is as if they, they were handing out these flyers and they were posting these flyers, they were handing them out and they were posting them on June 7th. The wedding was totally fictitious. The bride and groom, totally fictitious. And they waited a week. And these professors went out and started interviewing students on campus. You'd be amazed. 
52% of everybody they talked to heard the wedding was great. <laughs> What's even more shocking, 12% were there. <laughs> they described the dress, they described the limousine, a wedding that didn't even happen. Isn't human behavior fascinating? I have to be important. I have to tell you. Lashon Hara. Sometimes you've heard that, that phrase, Lashon Hara. Okay? Evil speech or an evil tongue. Some think that it's Lashon Hara, evil speech has to do with it telling a negative lie. Wrong. Okay? Lashon Hara is not telling a negative lie. Lashon Hara is telling a negative truth. A negative lie is called slander, okay? You can be sued for that. A cable news network, which will go unnamed, a cable news network, which I'm not gonna give you the letters for, has been sued several times over the past year or so for slander because they lied and they lost millions of dollars because of lying. That's slander. No, Lashon Hara is spreading a negative truth. Okay, so what's an example of this? Let's say you're working and your boss is having an affair with his secretary and it is 100% true. And then you decide to go to the second floor and you tell everybody on the second floor and then you take the elevator up to the third floor and you tell everybody up on the third floor and you'll tell the janitor if he stops mopping. Okay, but you say, but I'm telling the truth. Why? You're trying to destroy a man. Oh, don't. I mean, if he's having adultery, I mean, he deserves it. That's just not up to you. What's the motivation? What's the motivation? We have to watch how we praise one another. He's such a good teacher. She's such a good wife. She's such a good cook. He's such a handsome man and on and on and on. We have to watch how we praise people and trust me, be careful of the people who always praise you. Be careful of the people who are always patting you on the back. Why? Solomon tells you, Proverbs 27, verse 14, he who blesses his friend with a loud voice early in the morning, it will be reckoned to him. The same voices that were laying down palm branches the same voices, Hosanna, son of David, the same voices a couple days later, crucified. Be careful. Be careful when someone keeps patting you on the back. The tongue, your tongue, my tongue is full of poison. Full of poison. True story, Oliver Sibyl. Oliver Sibyl, the year was 1975. Uh, Gerald Ford was president of the United States. Gerald Ford was in San Francisco at an event, something or other, and a woman by the name of Sarah Jane Moore had acquired a gun. And Sarah Jane Moore had decided that she was going to use that gun on the president. Oliver Sibyl intervened, thwarted the attack, and overnight Oliver Sibyl became a national hero. He pleaded with the media at that time, 1975, he pleaded with the media, don't publish anything about me. But that didn't stop the LA Times. And the LA Times started digging into Oliver Sibyl. Who was this man? And come to find out in San Francisco, he was involved in some gay causes. Well, to make matters worse, then a reporter decided to go to Detroit. Why? Because that's where his parents lived. His parents had no idea of their son's lifestyle. They were devastated and his mother stopped talking to him. Four years later, she died. His father called up Oliver's Sybil to inform him that his mother had passed, but he was not invited to the funeral. Sibyl isolated himself. 
severely depressed, began drinking heavily, and at the age of 47, took his own life. And he left behind a post-mortem comment, and it read this, quote, if I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't. Words, simple words. There's what's called the golden rule. <laughs> I think most people probably think it's somewhere in the Bible. The principle is there, right? Do unto others as you would like others to do unto you. Well, if that's the case, then why do we do what we do? Every one of us, every one of us has something in their past that's embarrassing. And you wouldn't like it, and I wouldn't like it if that was made public. Then why do we do that? Why? No. Instead of uplifting and edifying and salt, we use our tongues to destroy and to humiliate and damage the reputation of others. So-and-so said this, so-and-so did that, they did this, they did that, and we will do anything to lower the respect of other people, oftentimes for no reason. I'm gonna humiliate you, I'm gonna besmirch you, I'm gonna ridicule you because I have freedom of speech. Look who I am. Proverbs 18, verse eight, the words of a tail bearer are like tasty trifles and they go down into the inmost body. Tasty. Now, at this point, you may be thinking, wow, I'm almost afraid to use my tongue anymore, all right? But no, there are times when you must. Is it ever permissible to pass on or pass along a negative report? The answer is yes. Sometimes you have an obligation to do that. If you, if you had a dear friend, perhaps they have an 18-year-old daughter. That 18-year-old daughter is now out of high school. She's in her freshman year of college. And hey, she sees the handsome football player on the team. They start dating. But you have come into contact with some information about that young man that he's had a run-in with the law, perhaps a convicted sex offender or something. You have an obligation to share that, that information with that girl. Do you know who you're dating. It's not to destroy him, it's to protect her. You have an obligation to do that. So there are times when, yeah, we're gonna have to pass along some information that's not gonna be very comfortable. But oftentimes when it comes to the tongue, that's not what we do. We use our tongues and we use our speech or even what we type to maim people, to maim people. The tongue has the power to have people murdered. How many people have been slaughtered over the past 2,000 years because some crazy person called Jewish people Christ killers? Words, words, deadly poison. Oh, we, we love to criticize. We love to criticize. I mean, I, I admire, I'll take on constructive criticism, constructive criticism. But we have to be careful how we criticize people. Uh, Telushkin in his book, he offers three suggestions before you criticize someone. Number one, how do you feel about offering this criticism? Does it give you pleasure or does it give you pain? I mean, really, if you're gonna criticize, are you looking forward to it? Are you gonna find enjoyment in this? Secondly, does my criticism offer specific ways to change? Oh, I see you're late for service again. Oh, I see you're late for work again. Okay, what's the follow-up? Is something going to be said in order to kind of rectify this problem? Are we gonna look for a solution to this? How are we going to resolve it? Thirdly, are my words non-threatening and reassuring? Truth be told, no one wants to get talked to like a four-year-old. You wouldn't like it, I don't like it. No one wants to be yelled at, no one wants to be scolded. Be careful. Be careful. If we are honest with ourselves, the rationale for wrongful acts 
is self-interest. Let me repeat that. The rationale for wrongful acts is self-interest. A thief breaks into your house. Why? He either knows something is there that is of value that he wants, or he broke in looking for something of value so they can take it. But that's why they broke in, to steal something. So when we use our words to hurt or to ridicule or criticize, what are we taking back? Why? We use our tongues to hurt and no other reason. Shift gears, let's talk about disputes. Let's talk about disputes. Because no two people will agree 100% of the time. Okay, I had a fellow years ago come to me. He and his wife have been married 10 years. He said, my wife and myself, we have never had an argument in 10 years. So you kind of look at him and two things come to mind. Either one, you're lying, or two, she's deathly afraid of you. I mean, or a combination of the both. So no two people are going to agree 100% of the time. Husband, wife, parent, child, employer, employee, pastor, congregant, what have you, right? Any relationship, there's gonna be some kind of disagreement. So how do we resolve disputes? A and B have a dispute. How do, how do they resolve the dispute? Yeshua tells you. Matthew 18, 15, you go to your brother, you go to your sister, whatever it is, and you settle it. Hey, I got this issue. Let's iron this thing out. If that doesn't work, then what does he say? Bring a witness with you and then sit down and iron this issue out. There is a process. So let's take husband and wife, A, B, because I'm only using, using that because that's where most disputes are going to happen in your marriage because you got two sinful people living under the same roof. Okay? So that's where most disputes are going to happen. So you got A, you got B, you got a husband and a wife. A has a problem with B, B has a problem with A. So what is B supposed to do to the wife? What's she supposed to do? You sit down with A and you talk with him. We need to settle this. That's not what B does. B goes and finds C. Could be a girlfriend. Could be what have you. Say, why? It is easier to get an agreement from C than it is to settle the dispute with A. If you're gonna sit down with the person you have the dispute with, that takes courage. Ooh, I don't have that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find me some sympathy. And so B, instead of addressing the problem with A, goes and finds C. He did this, and he did this, and he did this, and he did this. And C is sitting there taking in all this information without A being there to give his side of the story. So at this point, what is this? It's called an opinion. Imagine, imagine a judge sitting in a, in a, in a courtroom, and you have the prosecutor sitting there. Where's the defendant? Well, he's not allowed to be here. So B is not trying to settle the dispute. B wants sympathy, and B is going to put together a mob. See, because I'm not going to settle the dispute with A. I'm going to get C on my side, and D, and E, and I'm going to form a mob, and we'll just outnumber A. And that's how we'll settle this thing. Numbers. I've come to find out when people criticize other people, okay, when I hear like a criticism, and I'm not talking about a constructive kind of, hey, we got a problem, some kind of deal. No, it's just a vast criticism that goes to show you're not praying for that person. The red flag goes up in my head. If I know you and I'm praying for you, intercessory prayer on a daily basis, I'm praying for you, 
I'm praying for your husband. I'm praying for your wife. I'm praying for your health. I'm praying for your children on a day after day basis. Intercessory prayer. It is going to be very hard for me to criticize and slander you to somebody else. So when I hear criticism and, and, and those kind of like rumors and gossip, all that tells me you're not praying for that person. That's what it is. Because you can't criticize and slander people that you love. Gossip and slander, and Solomon calls it tasty. Tasty. It, it satisfies the taste buds. Because we're, really, we're selfish. We're selfish. I love the taste of good food, if you haven't noticed. I love the taste of good food, right? What? I'm, hey, I want to satisfy my taste buds. And so I want to feel better about myself. Even though I shouldn't be eating the chocolate ice cream. So I want to feel better myself about myself. And so in order to do that, watch, I'm going to, in a way, I'm going to raise myself higher by pushing you down. And that's what we do. And sometimes, sometimes I've seen this, we do it in public. In public. If there's one thing I have seen through the years, and I hate it. I don't think there's an English word that describes really how I feel about a husband who humiliates his wife in public. There isn't a word made yet. Because something, when I see that, you know, I, I read people and I watch. Let's be honest, when we all go out of the house, we put on some kind of mask. You put your best, they call it the best foot forward, right? You, 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 you act differently in public than you do in private. We all do it. So if I'm watching a husband ridiculing and humiliating his wife in public, my first thought is, what's going on in the house? And I've seen that. What gain do we get? A thief breaks in to steal something. What are you gaining by hurting people in public? What is it about ruining somebody else or somebody else's reputation in public? And Tolushkin writes in his book, quote, there's a tremendous psychological gratification in seeing someone else's social status decline. It's satisfying. And so even my wife, who I love so dearly, I'm going to humiliate you because I can do it. And look who I am. Look at my position. Aren't I important? I'm gonna, in other words, I'm gonna knock you down a peg or two so I look better. It's intriguing. Just the opportunity to ridicule, to criticize, to humiliate. Tolushkin says, quote, Jewish law regards humiliating another person, particularly in public, as one of the cruelest things one can do. Public humiliation is a trauma from which few people ever recover. Really? Because if you're going to do that to the person supposedly that you love, what's going on in the home where nobody else is around? When we speak ill of someone, it disintegrates any potential relationship we could have had with that person, and it destroys the very people we've come to know and love. Look, some of you, you've met me for the first time. There are others that know me so well. I love to laugh. I love to joke. I love to tell jokes. I love to make people laugh. I've come to find out through the years. That me, I like to joke, but I got to be careful because sometimes my words in my joking hurt people. And I don't mean to do that. If you really know me, I don't mean to hurt. I just, I want to joke. I want to say something. And even after I say, like, man, why did I do that? I, I heard a, he was an evangelist that when I was still living up north, he stopped in and he gave this message. Lou Rossi. And um, Lou Rossi, he, he was a man, he, he didn't like cats. In fact, he couldn't stand them. 
right? You couldn't stand him. And so he would, he was really a roving evangelist. He would go from this church to this church to this church, on and on and on. And what we do is we call it like an icebreaker, right? When you get into a crowd, you get into a church, what a, what a synagogue, what have you, to try and break the ice, you use a joke or two to kind of light, lighten things up. And so he would say things about cats because he couldn't stand them. And uh, he would draw laughs from people and, and whatnot. And he said, one night, as he was getting his things together, a lady came to me and he said, she said, uh, Mr. Rossi, she goes, you, you know, I really respect you, but you said something that, that really hurt me tonight. I said, I love cats. And supposedly she had a house with several of them in there. Those were her little babies. And she loved them. And she goes, Mr. Rossi, you hurt me. And Rossi said, it hit him. He said, what am I doing? He said, yeah, I'm trying to get a laugh. But why am I there? I'm there to preach the gospel, give the good news, give the truth. And I said something and I hurt someone and I don't want to hurt anybody. And he said, I'm never going to say anything negative about cats again. And that was it. Because he knew he hurt someone. The shaming of someone, just for personal gain, it's deplorable. I never quote the Talmud of all things. <laughs> it's not authoritative at all, but even the Talmud has something to say about this. It warns us those who humiliate others, calls them angry people, angry people. And angry people have angry hearts. Hearts that are cold and insensitive and unrepentant. And folks, you gotta be careful when you're around angry people because it will rub off on you. I know, it will rub off on you. I've used this analogy plenty of times. If you have the flu and you step down to an elevator and there's five healthy people there, are those five healthy people gonna make you well or are you gonna get them sick? It's the way it goes. So if you're around an angry person with an angry heart, it's going to rub off on you. And unfortunately, some people, you got to treat them like a leper. you got to treat them like a leper. Stay away from me. Just stay away. For your own health. In closing, oh, words, 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 words. Last year, uh, through the summer, the race riots, it, it has really, it's divided a nation. It's, it's two nations living on the same land. It's unfortunate. And the riots were going through throughout the summer. And there was one in Omaha, Nebraska last year. A man by the name of Jake Gardner, white individual, and he and his father were being assaulted or so on by a group of black youths. They were out, he had a gun on him for protection. He fired off a warning shot and the youths ran off, except one, a man by the name of James Scurlock. James Scurlock had a record already. Young fellow had been in trouble with the law several times and Scurlock jumped on the back of Jake Gardner, drove him to the ground and put him in a chokehold. There is video of this, I've seen it. He drove him to the ground and put him in a chokehold. He was killing him. Gardner took his gun and fired off a shot in self-defense, killing Scurlock. The police had the video, did not charge him because without question, it was self-defense. But the media would have none of it, nor would the mob. And they wanted Gardner. He started receiving threats. His family started see, receiving threats. The media started proclaiming him as a racist. He was not. They said he was a white supremacist. He was not. 
They said he had a swastika tattooed on his body. That was a lie. Eventually, a activist prosecuting attorney, special prosecutor by the name of Fred Franklin, started digging, of all things, into Jake Gardner. Remember, this is a man who was being choked to death. Started digging into him, and who is this man, and what is his voting record? Oh, we found a picture with a MAGA hat on, and on and on and on. And they took this thing to court, and to make a long story short, Jake Gardner was indicted. His family was threatened. They were going to burn their house down, and on and on and on. Jake Gardner could take no more. Four days after his indictment, he took that gun and blew his own head off. Words. 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 Oh. Oh, the poison that sits in the tongue. That poison set Omaha, Nebraska on fire last year. We have to be so careful. I know. Just... I know the history, I've seen it, what can happen when the tongue can divide, even divide a congregation. I've seen it, I've experienced it. Sometimes you look back and you think, wow, what could I have done? What should I have done? I was a little too late. I've seen it where people just maliciously hurt people with their tongue with no remorse. No remorse. And I'm talking a brother in the Lord. No remorse. Father, we come before you. Uh, it is a, a huge responsibility. I am guilty of it. I'm sure everybody that's heard this message has been guilty of it. We take it for granted. You have given us a tool, a tool in our mouths, and every single one of us has it. We have the ability to speak. We have the ability to type, to express our thoughts in word, whether they be audible or whether they be on a screen. And how many times, Lord, have we failed to use the tongue in a way that brings you honor and glory? How many times have just simply maybe just a simple conversation, uh, an innocent conversation turned into something that it never should have been? And it was just the tongue. Lord, we... We lift up these issues to you. It is a huge responsibility that you've given us. You've given us the ability to speak. And that ability to speak, you have given it to us for no other reason than to bring you glory. Than to bring you glory and honor and prestige to worship you, to proclaim your truth, your gospel to those who are lost. You've given us the tongue to sing. You've given us the tongue to hold off the decay, the decay in a, in a society that is, that is crumbling down around us. It's our responsibility. And Lord, we have failed you so many times that we beg for your forgiveness. Lord, let these words, these words that have come out of my mouth, and have entered into the ears and the minds and the hearts of those who are listening. May we not walk out of this place not changed. May we consider our actions, our words, our speech, our thoughts. Examine our hearts so that that which sits in the heart doesn't come out the mouth and then it find, we find ourselves in trouble. Lord, we lift up these matters to you because we are sinful human flesh. But praise be to God, we do have your Holy Spirit in us. It resides in, it, in us. 
it will reside there forever. And we thank you for that. And we also have your word. So Lord, help us to meditate over these things. Help us to meditate over your words so that our words can not only glorify your name, but help edify those that are around us. We're going to lift up these matters to you, Lord. In Yeshua's precious name as always. Amen. Amen.